This week on Q&A, our guest is Evan Osnos, staff writer for The New Yorker. Mr. Osnos just returned from China, where he's been writing for the magazine. Evan Osnos, your best friend is having coffee with you. You just got back from China, and he says to you, what's going on? What would you tell him? What's the first thing you would tell him? I would say that right now is probably China's first dose of reality in the last 30 years. What I mean is that the economy, after 30 years of almost irrational growth, is having a bit of a cold bath. And they're figuring out that actually China is governed by a lot of the same rules we are. Things are slowing down for the first time in a lot of people's lifetimes right now. How do you see that? Well, you start to see sort of minor indications of it around in a very day-to-day -day sense. I look outside my front door and I see that there are more guys, day laborers, looking for work than there were even six months ago, nine months ago. Big construction sites that started before the Olympics, some of them have stalled now in Beijing. But I think fundamentally, the sort of engine of growth that has been driving China's changes over the last 25 years has not changed. That continues to power forward. What's a day like for you? What do you do? in that 24 hours besides I assume you sleep sometime. I try desperately to keep up with everything that's online in Chinese, frankly. I mean, that's the most overwhelming part of trying to write about China right now. If you compare it to, say, 10 years ago, what I have to do when I get up in the morning is to figure out what the bloggers have been saying, what the state-run media has been saying, what the semi-independent media has been saying. And then between that, of course, you've got very knowledgeable Western analysts writing about it. So I spend a few hours every morning kind of getting up to speed on what's been happening over the last day or so. Um, and then I work on magazine work. I write pieces for The New Yorker, and then also I have a blog at newyorker.com. And so that's a piece of the day that I have to figure out what is the th mood at the moment? What is something that I can add that other people haven't already said before? And uh, that, of course, these days is getting harder and harder. How long have you lived in Beijing this time? I've been there four years now. What are the living circumstances? I live in a small house, one-story house in a Chinese neighborhood. I used to live uh, in an apartment building on the east side of town where a lot of foreigners live, where you have Starbucks on every corner. Um, I actually found as a reporter that can be a misleading way to live because it puts you at a real distance from the people you're trying to write about. So I moved west, uh, first into the center of the city, and then last year I moved uh, further west into a really Chinese neighborhood. I mean, it's the same neighborhood that the old Chinese explorer in the 15th century, Zheng He, lived on. I mean, my street is named essentially for this old 15th century eunuch who once sailed from China to Africa. And there's a lot about the neighborhood that's actually uh, the same as it would have been 50 years ago. How's your Chinese language skills? It's okay. I studied as an undergraduate in the U.S. and in China, and it's been making progress while I've been in China over the last four years. How often will you be in a Chinese citizen's home, and will they be in your home? I see Chinese citizens all the time. I mean, that's my job, and that's sort of the, uh, the big difference between doing this job from 10 years ago, I suppose. But um, I'm in Chinese people's home. I would say Chinese people's homes a couple times a week. Um, but it depends on the story. A lot of times, if you're working on something sensitive, then you don't want to be in somebody's home. You want to go to a place where they feel comfortable, where their neighbors won't notice that you're around. I mean, for instance, last year, I worked on a series of stories about religious freedom. And if you want to do a story about religious freedom, you have to think about what happens when you, as a guy who looks like this, marches up into somebody's apartment. Because you can be guaranteed that everybody in the neighborhood is going to know about it. And after you leave, if the person you're seeing is already under under scrutiny or is being supervised in some way, then it's going to cause them problems. So a lot of times we try to figure out some sort of neutral party. I spend a lot of time in kind of dingy restaurants, in back rooms, talking to people in whatever chosen location they've picked. Uh, of all the things you could define as being different than the United States, where would you start? Competition. Everything that you want to do in China is competitive. I mean, of course, it's difficult to get into a great American school, but to put it in perspective, if you want to get into the best Chinese college, you're obviously competing against a much, much larger pool than you would be in the United States. And so that has a hardening effect on people. I mean, there's a kind of, I mean, one of the things that people have said over the last few years in China is that they feel like the moral bond, the bonds that tie people together are fraying because in some ways, you have to be on your guard all the time. If you want to get your child into the best school, if you want to get them into the best kindergarten, then you don't really have the luxury of caring as much about your neighbor as you might have before. 
So it's, uh, I mean, these days, you, if, if you want to get any kind of job, particularly now that the economy is slowing down, uh, people are tough. And, um, uh, and I, but I, you know, I fundamentally think that the Chinese and, and, and us actually have a lot more in common than we have uh, that divides us. Give us an example. Well, if you think about the emphasis on education, I mean, these days, a lot of the major debates that are going on in China and public policy are actually the same debates we have here. It's about how do you create a social safety net, reasonable health care for people? How do you make sure that everybody has access to education? Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, that gets covered up when we look at the fact that, you know, China still has ostensibly a socialist government in power. And, uh, but in every practical way, life in China as an average Chinese college graduate, for instance, is not all that different from being an American college graduate. Why did you leave the Chicago Tribune and go to the New Yorker? Well, I was lucky that the New Yorker s somehow found a place for me there and said, why don't you come over and do this full time? I'd been writing for the New Yorker and the Tribune at the same time for a few months, and uh, moonlighting at the New Yorker was a tough thing to do. So uh, I moved over last fall in October. We hear about the Chicago Tribune being in bankruptcy. Did they, did they replace you in Beijing? They didn't, which is the end of a glorious legacy for the Tribune in China. I mean, the Tribune was one of the first American papers that went over there when correspondents were allowed to come back after resumption of U.S.-Chinese ties, 1979. In fact, I was there last year with the first correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, a guy named Tim McNulty. And we went around. It was a sort of sad bookend to the process. Um, but uh, the last thing I did was pull the plaque off the wall and, uh, and bring it back to Chicago and give it to Tim as a memento. But the Chicago Tribune, a couple of years ago, had 11 foreign correspondents around the world, which was big even for a regional newspaper. And uh, they've since folded their foreign staff into the Los Angeles Times foreign staff. And there, it's, you know, there used to be a lot of regional papers that had foreign staffs, and they don't have them anymore. 1998, Harvard? Yeah, graduated well, in What was your degree? I studied political science. What countries have you actually lived in? I've lived in, uh, in Egypt and uh, I would say in, in Iraq, but that was sort of part-time with Egypt, and now I live in China. Just for a moment, how does the Iraq war look to you from Beijing? Things have changed so radically in the years since I left. I left Iraq at a kind of important moment, which was the beginning of 2005, when they had their first legislative elections. It was at a point where the war was going uh, terribly, and it shaped a lot of my impressions of what happens when you try to implant political values in another place. In fact, I think it sort of shaped the way I looked at China. I came to China and I said, if we try to push China in a direction that China doesn't want to go, the results are not going to be what we want. Um, so, that was, so I was sort of post, I was in Iraq, sort of post honeymoon and pre-surge. But I'd love to go back one of these days and see what it looks like these days, because a lot of the people that I knew there and a lot of the places I went have, uh, their lives have been transformed and, and uh, things are totally different than they were in 2005 from what people are telling me. You had a, in one of the stories or feature stories you wrote for the New Yorker, I think this was New Yorker, you had a statistic <clears throat> that in China that the top 10% of the people hold 40% of all the assets and that the bottom 10% only have 2% of the assets. In this country, 1% of the people have 40% of the wealth. So mm -hmm. what's the difference? It sounds like the same statistic. That's the amazing thing. I mean, China has become one of the countries with the largest income gaps in the world. And that's made only more ac acutely uncomfortable for the leadership because, after all, on paper, they're still the People's Republic. But that issue ripples through just about everything in Chinese life. I mean, it's every few months we see some sort of major incident of the following kind. For instance, somebody will drive through a village in their BMW, they'll hit a vegetable seller, and the crowd will turn on the driver. And it's not just because of that incident, it's because there's a sort of pent up fury uh, surrounding the ways that people are able to find jobs and the sort of rewards they get, but also their sense of who the government is there to serve. This is the third rail in Chinese politics. And I think that the leadership, if there's one thing that keeps President Hu Jintao up at night, it's the fact that he's got this gap between rich and poor. And then that they don't have the kinds of instruments, political instruments, to release that steam in an organized fashion. So what happens is you get these incidents, you get these blow-ups where people will turn on the driver of that car, but then there's not a, a, an above-ground kind of logical way that they can start to solve these kinds of local disputes.
Give us size. What's the latest population figure? 1.38 billion people. But the truth is, nobody really knows. Uh, but, uh, you know, some people say it's as large as 1.7 billion. I think it's probably closer to 1.4. The last g figure I saw on, on our websites is that in January, 24% of our foreign debt was owned by the Chinese, $730 billion. Have you heard anything new since then? No, that's about the right number. I mean, and that is a huge uh, obstacle for the Chinese to figure out how to deal with their current economic crisis. Their hands are tied. I mean, they've got this mountain of U.S. assets, of dollar assets. And on the one hand, they can push theoretically for there to be, as they call it, a, a new super sovereign currency, something beyond the dollar that people could could hold on to. But if they do anything to move out of the dollar, then it's going to reduce the value of their own holdings. So they're in a trap. I mean, this is the, the problem right now, is that they have very little mobility. All they can do is advocate for a change in the global financial system, but they really can't lead that change or the value of what they have will decline. How much of American business do you see in China? It's everywhere. I mean, everybody, everything from Days In and Pizza Hut and Starbucks uh, up to, obviously, uh, major industrial manufacturers. Um, but what you see also is this gradual shift from the, uh, originally the, these were American manufacturers that went to China and essentially s hired Chinese contractors to do their business for them. Chinese contractors are now coming into their own and they're able technically and politically to push out their American uh, their original American patrons and go into business for themselves. So you're starting to see this evolution from these American-owned factories to uh, to really a sort of Chinese-run industrial sector. Are Americans making money in China? They tell you they, they are, and that's a change from 10 years ago. Um, right now is a tough time. I mean, Chinese exports from China are down 25 percent since the beginning of the recession. And the effect is enormous. I mean, we're talking about a huge number of people unemployed, and that's obviously rippling back to their employers. But Chinese statistics say that 50,000 businesses have gone out of, uh, 50,000 factories have gone out of business since this started. And it's hard to understand how much that really has an impact because Chinese statistics don't actually account for a lot of these people being unemployed. So sometimes it's a little hard to tell how much their American companies are taking a hit and how much the Chinese companies are taking a hit. I got on the Xinhua. Um, Newswire today, uh, and I found some interesting things I want to ask you about. What is Xinhua, and should I believe what I'm reading? It's better than you think it is. Xinhua is the state-run news service. All of its income, more or less, comes from the government, and there's no question it serves the purpose of being the government's mouthpiece. So you should take it with a grain of salt. On the other hand, the Chinese media is not at all what we used to think of it as this uh, kind of, you know, sleepwalking, uh, mouthpiece for everything that the government wants to say. Every day they run routine stories about what President Hu Jintao said in his meeting with the Zambian foreign minister. But the reality is that they also have started to go out and push the boundaries of what's possible. I mean, I'm continually impressed with what Chinese journalists are able to do. And it's, it's, it's bold and it's kind of canny. A lot of times what they'll do, for instance, if they can't get away with reporting a story in Beijing because it's too politically sensitive, well, then they'll send a reporter out to some western province, out to Shanxi or out to Xinjiang and have them report the story out there because they can get away with it. So they're, all the time you run into interesting and sort of bold examples. This is from uh, the People's Daily Online. It's all, it doesn't say who wrote it. But, and I, more statistics I got online. In the history of our country, I think we have built and maintained something like 68 aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. We have 11 aircraft carriers currently in the water, functioning by the United States Navy. All the rest of the countries of the world combined add up to 10 aircraft carriers. China's never had one. Mm -hmm. Here's what I found. Maybe you saw this this mm -hmm. morning. Special report. China marks 60th anniversary of the Navy. The discussion on China's construction of its own aircraft carrier has again become lively with the upcoming activities marking the 60th anniversary of the founding of the People's Liberation Army and Navy. Uh, aircraft carrier? Why? It's inevitable from the Chinese perspective. They see themselves eventually as resuming their place as a great naval power. After all, they'll tell you that my neighbor in, uh, in, in this Chinese neighborhood was a great admiral in the 15th century, and he rode the high seas. They, since then, they have since then not had a major navy. Basically, it's responsible for policing their own borders. But over the last few years, they've decided that they have to be able to protect their own sea lines of communication. I mean, they've got oil, they've got all of their 
assets essentially tied up in these uh, in these sea lanes that go from the Middle East uh, or through the Straits of Malacca and up to China, and eventually they want to be able to protect their own interests. These days, they're starting to push further out already. You've already seen Chinese naval vessels in the in in the Gulf of Aden participating in these joint anti-piracy activities. The United States has been supportive so far. They say it's better to have China at the table participating. You know, let's have a spirit of transparency and open openness. On the other hand, the United States is watching it very closely. China says they want to have an aircraft carrier, but they don't say when they will have it. Best estimate is probably 2015, maybe 2020, before they have something that's really usable. But the fact that you see a story like that in Xinhua, this is not a piece, this is not a muckraking. This is a release, essentially. And you should assume that this is the first or sort of one of the early ways of broadcasting their intentions. Well, let me read some more of this so you can give us your analysis. For the Chinese people, a more distant memory can be traced back to the, you have to pronounce this, it looks like a Methus incident. Do you know that mm -hmm. word? A-M-E-T-H-Y-S-T, -E incident before 1949, the founding of the People's Republic of China. On the Yangtze River, an inland waterway of China, when a skirmish broke out mm -hmm. between a British warship and a, uh, the People's Liberation Army troops that were preparing to cross the Yangtze, Winston Churchill roared in London that Britain should send a couple of aircraft carriers to the Far East for retaliation. China ha is is in some ways saddled by its own sense of history. It goes back frequently. In a story like this, you'll see them referring offhand to events that happened in the 19th century, in the Opium Wars, for instance. And this is very much in the decision-making process that the Chinese Navy thinks about. They see themselves as eventually trying to redress the crimes of the 19th century when China was carved up by foreign powers and humiliated is the word that they always use. It's described as the hundred years of humiliation. And you can't overlook how important that is in shaping their sense of grievance. So for them, this is not just a tactical, strategic choice to have an aircraft carrier. This is actually about reclaiming China's rightful place in the world. But if you think about what, what happened on the Associated Press wire here, a reporter mm -hmm. would either see the anniversary and decide they want to write about the aircraft carrier, or the Navy would feed them the idea. How do you think this started? Where, where in the hierarchy of the Chinese government would they begin to want to plant this story? Well, let's assume for the second that it's probably from within the defense establishment. Though a decision like this, I can promise you that there's nothing about an aircraft carrier and, and the release of information is done without major civilian, which means Communist Party involvement. So let's assume that this begins with somebody in a senior position, a civilian military leadership saying, well, it's time for us to, to use the anniversary, the 60th anniversary, as an occasion to step up the pressure and to start a, sort of acclimatizing the world to the fact that we want to have an aircraft carrier. Then it's not all that complicated. In fact, it's not all that different from, I think, the way a newsroom in the United States works. I have a lot of friends who are Chinese journalists, and it's very routine that they'll have an editor come over to their desk and say, here's a news release from such and such ministry, or here's the agency. Um, here's the relevant information for you. It's essentially all laid out there. And then it's up to them to write it up. So there, but what's really interesting is that there are levels of investigative freedom that they have. A story like this, minimal freedom. They really have almost no opportunity to go out and dig up original reporting on the subject of China's aircraft carrier plans. So they'll take what's given to them, and that's very explicit. The editor will say, essentially, you're going to write this release. There's a word in Chinese for it, Tongao, which is the official government press release. And the Chinese media then essentially rewrites it and puts it out on the wire in news format. But there are other cases where they have more mobility. So for instance, swine flu, let's take that as an example. In that case, they may say to them, uh, to a reporter, let's figure out actually what's happening. What are our capabilities and where are our limitations? How much are we ready for something like this? And in that case, there are bold reporters who are able to go out and do some original reporting. And you see it in the Chinese press. And oftentimes it can start to drive policy. Let me, don't, let me not give up on this release because it's got some interesting stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Thus, in many people's minds, the aircraft carrier has become a symbol of hegemony. There are so many considerations attached to an aircraft carrier. When news broke out that the China Navy was going to develop its own aircraft carrier, all kinds of voices flooded people's ears. Foreign media were full of suspicion, asking the reasons why China wanted to build an aircraft carrier. And when the country... Uh, uh, were to have its own aircraft carrier if it would behave like the powers in the old days to contend for maritime hegemony. The fact that there even is debate on this subject is a measure of progress in China. If the government's chosen policy is to have an aircraft carrier, and it's by all accounts it essentially is at this point, the fact that they're even permitting that to happen in a news story 
is a nod in some sense to the debate. And there is a lot of debate. I read about it online. I mean, the, the aircraft carrier is something that you read about constantly. It's almost a byword for China's global ambitions. They don't actually mean what sort of, you know, naval device are we going to have. What they mean is what is the boundary of our ambitions? Do we actually want to be a global power? Because these days they read global power as global policemen and they look what that did to us and they say the United States has lost prestige and standing in the world because of its efforts to try to be everywhere all the time. And they're not sure if they want to play that role. Uh, but I think, you know, ultimately the decision is not going to be made around public debate. It's going to be made at the highest levels. Uh, this is, I, I want to get your take on this. Uh, as a, and, and I found it interesting that you, they would write this, as a Chinese saying goes, mm -hmm. The water that bears the boat is the same that swallows it up. Mm -hmm. Once this principle is understood, it is easy to comprehend the long, arduous journey that China has taken to decide to build aircraft carriers. Likewise, the belief that Chinese aircraft carriers will emerge in front of people overnight is obviously naive. Hmm. Well, I mean, there is actually a case to be made, and the Chinese are very, are very aware of it on a geostrategic level, that they don't want to push too far too fast. They'll make themselves vulnerable. I mean, at the moment, the most important thing for them is to shore up their domestic economy. And that's what, that's what they're focused on. So they look at this and they say, is this a boondoggle that's too soon, too fast? But you, I hear about the aircraft carrier, for instance, in, in strange context. I mean, there was a, a, a news story that was describing the ways in which the Chinese economy has burst, or sort of the China's stature has burst onto the world scene. And they were describing examples that seemed like they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. One of the examples was that a Chinese tycoon had reached, recently bought some huge collection of French wine, you know, some obscure chateau's wine, and that that was considered a great moment of ascendancy for China, that they were now cultural equals to the great wine collecting nations, whatever that means. And then they said, and meanwhile, we also have this aircraft carrier program. So in a sense, the aircraft carrier is, is really at this point uh, symbolic. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're allowing it to be debated in the way that it is, because what they're ultimately saying is, uh, how big do we want to get and does this make us vulnerable? Go back to your day. You didn't give us all the details we need. Um, you say you eat a lot of Chinese food in Chinese restaurants? Yeah. Does I Chinese do. food there taste like it does here? No, actually. I mean, one of the things about Chinese food is that there's 25 different varieties of it that you can get in Beijing. So I, a lot of times you'll eat Sichuan food or Hunan food or something, or Xinjiang food, which is from way out west, a lot more like Turkish food or Middle Eastern food. I eat a lot of Chinese food, partly because of the neighborhood I live in. It's, it's basically all Chinese. Well, they, they have Hunan food here and Sichuan food and Mandarin and all that, but I don't see a whole lot of difference in the taste. I mean, the, the level of hotness doesn't seem to appear in most of our Chinese restaurants. Somewhere over the Pacific, it gets sanitized, <laughs> and by the time it arrives here, it's, I think, you know, made to be palatable to us in the States. But in China, you give, you know, wild varieties, and, and people are incredibly passionate about it. I mean, one of the reliable ways to get to be friends with somebody in China is to spend an incredibly long time talking about the food from where they're from. This is one of my favorite things to do. You know, you find out where somebody's from and you start asking them questions about what the specialties are. And this is actually, it goes beyond small talk because in some ways that's the way that you can indicate to somebody that you have some knowledge but you're also curious and that you're not trying to be arrogant about what you know about China. Is it true that the fortune cookie is an American invention? Utterly. I've never heard of it in China. I've never seen anything like it. But there is dessert. They eat Chinese dessert all the time. It's, it's big business, in fact. So what, when you conceive a story idea. Mm -hmm. Who do you think about reading it? What, what's in your eye when you think about reading it? It partly depends on whether the story is for the magazine or whether it's a blog post, for instance. I mean, a blog post, which is a big part, in fact, of where The New Yorker and every other magazine needs to go, is a different kind of meal. Basically, you're giving somebody something just to tide them over and potentially to lead them to longer work that you're working on. It's a, almost like a sort of status update for your mind. You say, here's what I'm thinking about, here's what I'm reading. Uh, these are the things that people in China are talking about. But for a magazine piece, oftentimes I try to figure out, is there something in this piece that is truly original? I mean, the simplest, oldest rule about news, and I think it's one that we forget these days more than we should, is that are you telling people something they didn't already know? Because if you're not doing it, there's less and less of a reason to get away with it. I mean, reframing the debate is, doesn't pass muster as much as it used to because people are inundated by this stuff. Which of your stories so far for The New Yorker, the big pieces, mm -hmm. has gotten the most reaction? 
There was a story I wrote last year called The Angry Youth, which was about Chinese young neoconservative intellectuals. And that generated a lot of discussion within China and in the U.S., partly because it sort of defies what we think about young Chinese people. I mean, if we think back to the most, in our minds at least, the iconic moment for Chinese young people was 20 years ago this spring, the 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uprising and the crackdown. And in that case, you know, we had young Chinese elite students rising up in the name of democracy, multi-party elections, very familiar ideas to us. But you fast forward 20 years and, and they're and these are, you know, their nieces and nephews, if not their younger brothers and sisters, who are now raised in this prosperous, in many cases, prosperous nation. I mean, obviously, there's vast stretches of China that are not this way. But on the coast, it's very easy to live a privileged life and to get the best kind of education, to have the prospect of getting a great job. And they look at their leadership and they say, they're not all half, it's not half bad. I mean, they're doing some things right. And so we've started to see this brush, this sort of blowback when we try to push uh, Western values on China too aggressively, young Chinese are some of the most fervent and vocal in resisting. So I wrote a piece about that and it generated a lot of discussion among Chinese, uh, both people who agree and disagree with that, that voice in China. Where did you find the idea? It started with a video that was posted online. Um, I'd been interested in this idea for a while, I should say, in the angry youth and these young neocons. But it started really when I saw this video called China Stand Up which was posted in the middle of a very tense moment last year when there was uprising in Tibet, in Lhasa, and China's government cracked down. This was in March of 2008. And after they cracked down and the world, in some ways, criticized what China had done, the Chinese youth rose up. And there were demonstrations in front of Carrefour, the French supermarket chain, because they said that France was pro-Tibet and uh, pro-Tibetan independence. And at the time, this video popped up on the web that was, it was very angry. It was sort of full of this sort of sweeping orchestral music, and it strung together a bunch of videos and photos to make the case, in the words of the video, that China was under siege and that there was a new Cold War facing the world. And I wanted to figure out who was this guy who made this movie. I mean, I figured he was either a bully or a nut uh, or, or something that represented an important new development. Well, it turns out, He's a 27-year-old PhD student from one of the best universities in China, Fudan University in Shanghai, immensely knowledgeable about the West. He's getting his PhD in phenomenology, a sort of branch of Western political philosophy. Speaks English, German, reads Latin, ancient Greek. And he had a reasoned critique to make about what the world thinks of China. And I spent a lot of time with this guy over the course of a couple of months and started to get a feel for what he and his friends stand for. And it's not as simple as saying these guys are these guys are skinheads or they're uh, basically just reverting to a kind of xenophobic attitude towards the West. It's not at all that simple. In fact, you know, they have very high expectations for what the West represents. You know, they really do genuinely admire the notions of democracy, pluralism, multi-party uh, politics. They also believe, though, that it's up to China to decide what the schedule is for those kinds of things to be adopted. And they sure, they don't want to have those kinds of changes take place in a way that would dismantle everything that they've benefited from. These are guys who have great jobs, they go to great schools, they say the status quo is pretty good and we want to defend it, we want it to keep improving, but we don't want to have uh, Western activists tell us how to shape China. And the thing that was most interesting about it, I think ultimately, as much as it makes us uncomfortable to see these kinds of guys in China, it makes the Chinese leadership even more uncomfortable because what they know is that these guys, they place their loyalty ultimately in the Chinese people, in the glory of the Chinese nation. They don't place their loyalty in the Chinese Communist Party. So if things change, then they could turn on a, on a dime. Why do they let them go? Partly because they have no choice. I mean, this is a significant body of public opinion that has now, on the internet, has a place to organize. So they let them vent. They let them discuss things on the web, for instance. Uh, most recently, they'll talk about comments about, um, I'll give you an example. Jackie Chan last week was quoted as saying that the Chinese people want to be governed and that they need to be governed. This generated a firestorm on the Chinese internet. On the one side, people were saying, well, he's got a point, actually. We do want to maintain control. We don't want chaos. On the other hand, people were saying, is he advocating for authoritarianism? That realm of debate never existed before. So the government doesn't want to close it off entirely because then it just pushes these guys into the street. 
I mean, in the Middle East, we would have said it pushes them into the mosques. In China, it would just push them into other sort of uh, other ways of expressing themselves that is not benign. So it lets them do stuff. But on the other hand, it, it monitors it very closely and it sort of turns it on and off. It allows them to express themselves sometimes. And when it gets too big, it chokes it off. I, I haven't seen a st statistic lately, but six, seven percent of the American population of 307 million uh, work for governments, state, local, uh, federal. How many, what, what's the percentage of people in China that work for government? I don't know the number, but the, it's, it's declined radically over the last 15 years. They've started closing down huge sections of the state-owned economy. All these factories that used to be churning out useless products were put out of business. And a lot of those workers then found their way into private industry. I don't think the numbers would be all that different from the American economy. I mean, in a lot of measures, the Chinese economy is comparable. I mean, if you look at the official rate of unemployment, we're both right around 4.6 percent. The reality is that there's a lot about the Chinese economy that we would find familiar. The difference is that China also has this big gray economy, the off-the-books economy. Um, so, I mean, depending on who you believe, the Chinese unemployment rate is actually much, much Well, here, higher. the unemployment rate is being stated as being 8.2 or something like that. Well, this is the thing about the Chinese economy is that officially it's 4.6. Some people say it's probably closer to 8% or 20%. Because you have these huge numbers of migrants who are now on the move, and they have been laid off from factories in the South that suffered because of consumer, the drying up of consumer demand, and they haven't been reemployed yet. And China doesn't really want to measure them. Explain this. Uh, Tibet, what, three, four million people? Yeah, more or less. There are 1.3, as you said, 8 billion people in China. Why do we spend so much time talking about Tibet? I we mean, spend and, a lot. And, yeah. and, then, and I want to add to that, do, do they have less freedom than the people in China have? I mean, they're, they, they do. China? Yeah, they do. They the, have the less freedom. The people in Tibet do have less freedom. I mean, this is an objective, rational statement of fact is that the people in Tibet are very closely controlled. On a day-to-day -day basis, that means that if you want to be an activist, for instance, you have less mobility in Tibet than you would if you were in Shanghai or Beijing. And that's because Tibet has been such a flashpoint over the years. The Chinese see Tibet as a central core issue. It has to do with, are they able to guarantee the sovereignty of the country? I mean, it began as a territorial issue, or are they going to allow the world to carve off a piece of what they consider to be their country. But now it's become about political sovereignty and will they allow themselves to be affected by Western attitudes. I mean, in a lot of ways, the Tibet issue has almost nothing to do with Tibet itself in the West. Of course, the vast majority of the people who would be active in Tibetan causes in some cases have never been to Tibet. And that's partly because China can make it difficult to get to Tibet. As a reporter, it's very hard to get to Tibet. I have you been there? No, I haven't been. And in fact, that's a, a telling fact. I mean, they, at this point, no reporters are able to get into Tibet. Unless when was the last gonna, time the Dalai Lama was there? He hasn't been there since he left, 1958. But why do people, I know a lot of American actors have been active with the Tibet issue. Why are they active about Tibet and not active about freeing China as... You know, what, what's the degree of difference? Tibet has a hold over the popular consciousness. There's something mystical about the place, undeniably so. It is, after all, the roof of the world. It's the Himalayas. It's a spectacular place. I've been to the edges of Tibet in a lot of different places. And in some ways, there's parts of Sichuan province and the, and the neighboring areas of China that are, that are as much like Tibet, or in fact, more like what Tibet used to be than what Tibet is today, because it's been very deliberately uh, reformed by the Chinese to make it more like uh, more like the East. But so Tibet has always had this hold over the public consciousness. And one of the things that baffles the Chinese, the Han majority Chinese, I should say, is why Tibet is such an issue in the West. And I think it's partly because China is so resistant to anything on that subject. China has dug in its heels on the Tibet issue and it says that is our bottom line. We're not willing to move on it. And recently what you hear is that public officials, Western public officials who go to China are hearing about the issue more and more, I mean, even more than they used to, which seems like a, I mean, it's irrational. It has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day mechanics of the relationship between China and the United States, nothing to do ultimately with the economy. And yet it's this persistent thorn in the side of the Chinese government. How long do you plan to stay in China? I'll be there at least another two years. I'm writing a book about foreigners in China, which will take me another couple of years. What do you mean by foreigners in China? Well, it, there's a great tradition of foreigners going to China ever since Marco Polo. And there's been terrific work looking at what happened to those 
foreigners' hopes and aspirations for China over the course of 400 years. I mean, the number of people who went there hoping either to convert the Chinese or to sell them something or to hire the Chinese or to invade them and subdue the Chinese, you know, generations of eccentrics and visionaries and interesting people have come, and almost all of them in some ways have failed. Right now, something is a little different. I mean, in the last 50 years, 60 years now, you've started to see China welcoming foreigners in a way it never has before. And there's people there who are running successful businesses. Um, there's people there who are missionaries. There's, um, there's scientific cooperation going on. There's genuinely amazing architecture being created in China that's not being created elsewhere. There's people developing electric cars in China that they couldn't develop in other countries because it would be too expensive. So China has gone from being this exotic frontier to being in some ways a laboratory for people to try out new ideas and to take advantage of what China has to offer. So I'm writing about a series of people who are trying to achieve their visions in China. From what kind of countries are they? A lot of them are Americans, uh, Australians as well, and Europeans. I'm writing about a small group of people. But, I mean, and I'll give you an example. I'm writing about an architect who's managed to do some extraordinary projects in Shanghai because he, it was open territory. When he got there five years ago, the Shanghai government didn't really understand how you can preserve these wonderful old districts in a way that keeps them around but also makes them usable for, for shops and restaurants and so on. This is the architect who worked on Faneuil Hall in Boston, worked in Baltimore, Miami, and he came to China. He said, we have a way to do this, to make sort of commercially viable preservation. And they let him do it. And they allowed him to redevelop districts that would be comparable to the downtown of, you know, the top 40 American cities. Huge, huge areas. And he's been able to do it there. If he was doing it in the United States, or as he, if he was an architect in the United States, as he will tell you, he'd be designing rich people's houses. But in China, he's making a permanent impact. How expensive is it for you to live there? It's cheap. But it's not as cheap as it used to be. I mean, as an example, my rent is about $2,000, for instance. That's for a house. A month. Uh, Two bedroom, yeah, two thousand dollars a month for a two bedroom house in an old Chinese neighborhood. You know, there are people who are spending ten times that. Expats, for instance, who are living in in gated communities on the edge of the city, which are great. And by you know by any measure, it's an equal quality of life to living in a lot of American cities. You can also live very cheaply. What's uh, it cost you a month for your electrical bill? Electricity is cheap because it's subsidized. It's probably about thirty five dollars a month. What about groceries and food and all that you bring home? That's incredibly inexpensive, partly because you can shop at the market, which is right nearby. There's an amazing outdoor market, size of a football field, which is about 200 meters from my house. So you can go over there and get every kind of produce you could imagine, and it costs nothing. I mean, it's almost inconsequential as the cost. That's one of the ways that China is still an amazing place to live. If you were going to buy a car, let's say it cost here twenty to $25,000, what would it cost in China? You can get cars in China as cheap as seven or $8,000. They're not, they don't have the safety standards that we would expect in the United States, but you can get a car that you could use. And that's partly designed because they want to be able to put Chinese people into cars. What about gasoline? Gasoline's roughly comparable. It's subsidized, but it's a little bit less. It never got up to the sort of stratospheric heights that it was a couple of years ago. Clothes? Uh, clothes are cheap. You can get clothes, uh, you know, in some cases for pennies, uh, for pennies for what they would cost for dollars here. So what brings you back to the States this trip? And how long are you going to be here? And how long have you been here? I come back three or four times a year. I'm here for two weeks and talking to groups around the country. I was at Yale yesterday talking to students there. What did you find at Yale? I was encouraged, uh, particularly on the subject of the news business. I mean, everywhere I go these days among journalists, nobody's talking about anything except the fact that the newspaper industry is in crisis. And I went there sort of curious about what young people think about how they will consume news in the future. I mean, basically, are people going to pay for news or do they expect that this is all going to be free? And what I discovered was actually they're saying, we're perfectly prepared for, to pay for news. I mean, in fact, we pay our cable bill right now, our cable internet bill. Why shouldn't we add on 10 bucks a month or whatever it would be to cover the cost of our news if that ensures that we have some sort of viable outlet? But they want it to be good and they want it to be exclusive and they want it to be quality. I mean, the comparison that I've sort of come to think of is the difference between local television and HBO. And they were all saying, we'd be willing to pay for the HBO of news. We're not willing to pay for the cheap stuff. Who else are you speaking to? I'm also speaking to an Asia Society conference in Chicago, and I'll be speaking at Brookings tomorrow in D.C. What, what do people want? To, what, what do you find that they want to know? I think these days people are interested in a few specific subjects. One is the subject of these young people 
and these angry youth. That's become a very important subject in, Ch in academic circles about China, basically the role of nationalism. Is it a genuinely grassroots phenomenon, or is this something that's orchestrated by the government? I mean, when we look back historically at the role that nationalism has played in, in emerging economies, it's, it can be, uh, in the case of Germany, obviously very disconcerting. And we're trying to figure out, is this something that's being orchestrated by the Chinese government, or is it authentic? And my argument is that it's, in many ways, authentic. I mean, the government allows it to happen, but this is a meaningful discourse, and we have to take it seriously. So that's one of the subjects. Another subject is Obama. People want to know what the Chinese think of Obama. What do they think of him? He's a rock star in China. I mean, on the popular level, he is very popular because of what he represents. And so, you know, he obviously, in many ways, to the Chinese eye, represents the inversion of everything that they saw for the last eight years. And they, one of the things that really seems to resonate with the Chinese is the idea that he came from nothing. I mean, all the time around the election, you saw headlines that said, grassroots president takes the White House. And that was the lead. I mean, that's the thing that they really responded to. And that goes back to what we talked about with the income gap, which is the, the perception in China today that there are whole realms of life that are off uh, that are inaccessible to people without connections. How many Chinese students are in American colleges? I've seen numbers that say somewhere around 70,000, but I don't know. I mean, it's, it, all of, I'll give you an interesting fact, is that the children of a lot of powerful Chinese officials go to, the, go to school in the United States, no question about it. In America, roughly 26%, I think, of the American people have a four-year college degree. How many, what's the percentage in China? Well, there's a lot of people who have four-year college degrees. There's also a lot of people who have PhDs. And at this point, they have an abundance of PhDs, and they don't have anything to do with them. Um, though I, I mean, the percentage is, can't be anywhere near that, can it? I don't know what the percentage would be. I mean, my guess is that in a lot of cases, I mean, for one thing, you have to pay for school. Um, it's the perception's always been in the West that Chinese education's free. It's not. In a lot of cases, you pay you know, exorbitant school fees. There's a whole lot of ways that they essentially separate who can pay and who can't. Um, but, uh, I mean, I actually think Chinese education is one of the things you notice when you go to these little cities is that all these little tiny cities are opening colleges. Colleges, I mean, on, this, on the scale of things we would recognize in America, vast universities in the middle of nowhere. Are they state-run? No, they're private in some cases. And that means that the quality of education is, you know, there's a huge range. In some cases, there's great schools. But in other cases, people get there, they pay their money, and they find out they've basically been built out of it. Do they have a Department of Education at the top of the Politburo that... Uh determines what kind of education you have to get? There is. There's a Ministry of Education. It's powerful, and it, it's able to sort of set some targets. But a lot of these things are governed locally. And what you've discovered is that, again, it's a lot like the United States, that if you can afford to take your kids out of the system and put them into a sort of parallel system of private education, that they do it. And that creates a lot of resentment as well. When is your next piece for The New Yorker? Uh, next week. I What's was, it about? It's a story about China's leading independent filmmaker, a guy named Jia Zhang Ke, who is, in fact, though he's probably a mystery to a lot of American moviegoers, he certainly was to me until a year ago. He's having a huge impact on cinema around the world. I mean, to put it in perspective, Martin Scorsese, who's quoted in the story, told me that Jia Zhang Ke has redefined cinema. So it's kind of interesting because here's a guy who's making these obscure art films and he's in fact starting to reflect, it's starting to, to have an impact abroad. And he's kind of defined a new way of looking at China. For a long time, Chinese films were what we think of Chinese films. They were Hong Kong uh, kung fu epics, you know, these big blockbusters like um, Hero or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, these kind of beautiful, lush landscapes mythologized China. He turned that upside down. He said, I want to make films about the country that I see around me. In many ways, they're very politically critical films, kind of arch films, where he talks about the problems for migrant populations and the problems for the problems of the environmental uh, catastrophe around the Three Gorges Dam. Um, and these are things that had never been put on film before. And so he's having a big impact in China. So how did you do the story? Well, I started hanging around with Jia Zhang Ke a lot, which I think made him a little confused because the Chinese media doesn't do it quite that way. I mean, they might come out for an afternoon. Uh, but for the New Yorker, we need to spend weeks with the guy. Uh, so where, where, did you, where, in what kind of a location was he on on uh, on a doing a movie? Yeah, the first time I met him was uh, up on a kind of frozen plateau in northern China. He'd gone up there to do a photo shoot. It was his first time ever doing still photography. But people had hired him to the Chinese edition of Esquire. 
they'd hired him to come up and shoot a kind of homage to his own movies. And uh, so he'd gone up there with a bunch of models and actors, and they were all in this absolutely barren wasteland in coal country in northern China, which is actually close to where he grew up. And I just started following him around, spent a couple days with him there, came back to Beijing, saw him in Beijing, and saw him as he tried to promote his new movie. What's interesting about it is that he's trying to walk this very fine line between being legal and illegal. He's trying to have an impact, but also still maintain a sort of critical posture towards the government. Now, when that's published in this country, uh, this is seen on a Sunday night, you can get it on a Monday, what impact will that have on him back in China? And is he aware of the impact it might have on him? In his case, he's particularly savvy about the Western media, partly because he's been involved in the film festival world for a few years. But it will have an impact on him immediately. And what I've found is that just about every story that we write about China in The New Yorker ends up being translated into Chinese spontaneously, just by Chinese web users and then disseminated online, which is amazing. I mean, they'll take a story that's five, six, ten thousand words in English, turn it into Chinese and distribute it, and the and translations are faithful. I mean, this is a, it's a, a sort of the best example of grassroots collective action on the web where people say these are things that we need to know about. It happened in the case of that angry youth story where it's all of a sudden started circulating in Chinese. Of course, my concern was, well, has this been edited to make it look sort of more palatable? In fact, it hadn't. I mean, I'll give you an example. Every week, The Economist magazine in English is spontaneously translated into Chinese. When I say spontaneously, I mean volunteers who organize themselves. They divvy up the magazine, and they turn it into Chinese, and they ship it out on the web for anybody who wants it. So within a few days, you can get the entire edition of The Economist in Chinese. It's not exactly an authorized edition, but from what I gather, The Economist has sort of winked because it allows them to reach a broader audience. How real is the perception that uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese steal our product, our rights, copyrights and all that, and resell them without any, any uh, adherence to the law? It's rampant. Piracy is everywhere. I mean, and it really is a big part of the economy. It's a big problem for the economy. So, for instance, you can go down the street and you can buy yourself a polo shirt and a Gucci bag and a Versace pair of pants, and they have absolutely no relationship to the real bands. I mean, they are just complete knockoffs. On the other hand, there's a new, well, I should say also that there has been some improvement. There's been lawsuits. The Chinese government has pledged to go after piracy, but the truth is they're a long way off from anywhere near compliance. I mean, the best estimates are that somewhere about 80 or 90 percent of all of the software in China is pirated. So even government agencies, for instance, are using pirated Microsoft products, which drives the American companies nuts. The problem is, is that uh, there's also this, well, the, one of the interesting things is that there's a sort of subculture of the piracy world that is not pure piracy. It's called Shenzhai in Chinese. And what it means is knockoff, but actually with a sort of Chinese twist. So they'll take an iPhone and they'll turn it into something that's 50% of the iPhone looks exactly like it, more or less, but it's uh, designed to be affordable to people on the street. So they go out and they're able to buy their Shenzhai, their fake knockoff iPhone. And this has become a point of pride for the Chinese because they consider it a sort of crafty solution to the fact that they can't afford the best products in the world. They say, well, our ingenuity and our creativity allows us to create these things. That word, Shenzhai, was one of the most searched words on the Chinese internet last year, which tells you something about what people are talking about. The hierarchy of the country, uh, sit in China and look at the United States. As we're talking about the aircraft carrier, we have 11 of them. They have none. Mm -hmm. They own $730 billion of our foreign debt um, and our, our treasuries and, and all that. What, what do you think they really think about the relationship of these two countries right now? I think they feel confident. They've never felt more confident in their relationship with the United States. And that's partly because of where we stand these days. I mean, economically and diplomatically over the last few years, we've, we have a lot of damage we need to repair. And they've seen the value of that for them. China can come in these days, and it, it likes being described as the other half of a G2 relationship. I mean, after all, China is no shrinking violet. It absolutely believes that it will reclaim its place in the world as a great power. Does it want to? It wants to. There's no question about it. Does it want to be number one? Depends who you talk to. I mean, China will say, I think philosophically, it considers it an inevitability that it will be number one. But I think practically it's concerned about that. Uh, when we hear the military in this country say that we need to build the military up because of China, what would you say to them? 
I think we're already pretty far ahead of the Chinese military. I mean, we are years ahead of where the Chinese military will be. It's not a reasonable, urgent, there's no urgency for us to try to uh, sort of speed up our own military uh, spending in order to match the Chinese because it's it's two different it's apples and oranges at this point the Chinese are down here and we're up here and so of course their percentage increases every year are much larger than ours but it's a that's a straw man for us to think that the Chinese military is in anywhere any way close to achieving parity with us is is a fiction on the other hand we can't afford to assume that this is benign the Chinese actually do see themselves on a trajectory to being a rival with the United States but they're trying to sort of package it carefully in a way that doesn't seem off-putting to us because they don't want to provoke a conflict. At this point they can't afford a conflict either economically or militarily so what they're trying to do is to build up their military to the level that they think is appropriate sort of commensurate with their economy and where they fit in the world without doing it in a way that provokes us. So um, what can the Chinese not do that we Americans can do? I mean we have this debate depending on who you talk to in this country right now they say we're becoming a socialist society. Um, can, you know, what is it if you lived in China and you weren't an American that you couldn't do that you could do here if you lived in this society? If I wanted to stand up in China and declare that the Communist Party no longer has a right to rule, I couldn't do it. There's no way that a Chinese citizen or a foreigner really, but a Chinese citizen in particular, could not stand up and question the primacy of the Communist Party. That is the bottom line for freedom of speech, for instance. If I put that in print, it's inevitable that I would, I would eventually, if I was a journalist, I'd lose my job and I'd, I might even face more consequences, might get thrown But as a citizen, do you have any say-so on who becomes either the prime minister, the president, or the head of the no. party? No. I mean, the selection of leadership is, remains the one province that the Chinese government has not opened up to popular participation. But in a lot of ways, the Chinese government is also more subject to popular control than we always assume. I mean, for instance, they have to respond now to the Internet because the Internet is for them a great barometer of what the Chinese public opinion is. And so they use it quite successfully. I mean, as an example, when we see the Chinese prime minister say, as he did last month, that he's concerned about the U.S. currency and that he wants the United States to maintain the value of the dollar and so on, what he's saying is actually to his own public, we are being responsible stewards of your interest and we know we've invested this vast fortune in US dollars and we're not doing it casually and we're going to hold the US to account. But they have to respond to their domestic constituency because the Chinese after all are very conscious, the Chinese leadership is very conscious that they came to power on the back of a peasant revolution in the name of communism and socialism and now their government has almost nothing to do with communism and socialism. So their legitimacy rests on being able to raise a standard of living and maintain public support. Well, even in a system here that has all these checks and balances, we have corruption, political corruption, we have people going to jail. What's to prevent the leaders in China from taking 25% off the top and putting it in their own accounts? There's a huge amount of corruption. I mean, that's the biggest problem that they face in terms of shoring up public support. I mean, the corruption is everywhere in the Chinese government. How do you see it? Uh, a, a judge, for example. You take a municipal judge who's dealing with routine criminal cases. It's pretty much uh, guaranteed that that judge is on the take and he's taking money from one side or another uh, if he's dealing with civil cases for instance whoever has the most money to give the judge is probably going to get away with it um, in the case of uh, local officials in fact not so local the equivalent of a state governor in China so a provincial governor those kinds of officials are routinely taken down they're uh, disciplined by their by the party itself if they're discovered for siphoning, if they're discovered to be siphoning too much money away. You know, in the United States, we have these sayings like, only in America, mm -hmm. only in America can a young person grow up in a small town in Kansas and become president of the United States and all that. Can you say the same thing in China? Absolutely. Only in China, you can come from nowhere and become the head person. Yeah, I'm continually amazed by these stories of sort of self-invention. There's a woman I wrote about recently named Zhang In, who came from a military family in the far, far northeast of the country. I mean, she had the deck completely stacked against her. Her father was a, was a general or a colonel in the, army, in the army who was eventually put away as a rightist during the Cultural Revolution. So she really had no opportunities, didn't go to college. Eventually, though, she sort of, through pluck and ingenuity, got herself into a position where she could learn about the economy in the South, where the, all of these reforms were going on. She eventually built a paper company that became the largest paper company in China. In fact, she was on 
track to be the largest paper company in the world before this recession. Can she keep the big profit? She keeps huge amounts of profits. In fact, she was ranked the richest person in China uh, two years ago. She was the richest self-made woman in the world. She was richer than Oprah. But a case like that is in some ways, you know, the Chinese media will, uh, will celebrate a case like that because it's the, it's this, it's the badge of what we're, of what they stand for. I mean, they say in this economy, you can achieve what you set out to do. She's the sort of Horatio Alger hero of the Chinese economy. But the reality is, is that she is very much the exception to the rule. And a lot of people, in fact, huge swaths of the population feel frustrated and, and cut off from those kinds of We, we say we're the envy of the world here in the United States. Does, do the Chinese envy us? In a lot of ways, they do. I mean, I think they envy the fact that somebody can move to the suburbs and have a house and a car and send their kids to the school they want to send them to and hopefully have access to health care. Those are the kinds of priorities that Chinese families have. It's nothing more exotic than that. I mean, they've put aside a lot of the politics that, that contributed to so much waste and loss of life during the 20th century, and they just want to basically have the kind of lives in a lot of ways that we do. If you could pick the, the spot to live in China, forget your work, where would you go? I think it would probably be Beijing. And I say that because Beijing is where everything intersects. I mean, a lot of people always think of Shanghai as the kind of cosmopolitan capital of China. It's not. In a lot of ways, Shanghai is risk averse. It's focused on finance and making money. Beijing is where you get every eccentric and every visionary eventually turns up. I mean, all of the great artists live in Beijing, all the great filmmakers. That's where the government obviously is based. So you've got a lot of these pressures kind of butting up against each other, and it's fascinating. If you're a tourist and coming to China, what's the one spot you would go to? Kashgar, which is the farthest western city in China. I mean, this is back from the days of the Great Game, one of the great epic destinations. It's out in Xinjiang province, out next to China's farther western border with Pakistan and Kazakhstan. And I mean, it takes a while to get there. You're gonna have to fly out first to Urumqi, and then you're gonna take another flight to get out to Kashgar. But when you get out there, you're gonna discover that you're in this part of China that looks nothing like what you imagine. I mean, this looks like the great sort of Turkic tradition of Central Asia. These people, their script is written in Arabic, um, they don't look Chinese in the way we think of Han Chinese as being typically Chinese. As you know, uh, awful lot of people in the journalism business think you have the dream job. Uh, your dream job may be over in two years. It, what would be your next wish in journalism? I think I, I want to keep writing about China for a while. It may mean I'll come back to the United States for a little while um, and then maybe go back to China again. But for the moment, I can't Truth, truth be told, I can't even conceive of what I could write about that would be more interesting than writing about China for The New Yorker. Uh, on that note, Evan Osnos, we must say thank you and uh, good luck on your trip back. Thank you. My pleasure. For a DVD copy of this program, Call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.